um, as I begin today, will you join me in prayer? Eternal God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to your, to your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today I've been asked to address the topic of, Christ, of the Christian virtue of humility. So I want to start with a personal story. Ten years ago, I went to China to teach pastoral care to pastors in the underground church. And my husband and I went. My husband is also a clergyman. And we were teaching what we would call here in the States an intensive course in Harbin. And it was all day for most of all of a week. And during that time, there was this one precious little break. And a church member who was serving as our guide and a church member who was serving as our driver wanted to take us on a sightseeing trip around Harbin. And it was summer, and it was very hot. Did I mention that it was very hot? <laughs> Um, it was somewhere around 105 degrees, I think. And you're thinking, oh, like a summer in Chicago, and I want to tell you. I, was, I grew up in the Midwest, and it was not like a summer in Chicago. It was very, very hot. The day for the excursion had come. We were to go as soon as we finished teaching. Uh, but after we had finished teaching, we realized it was pouring rain outside, just pouring torrentially. Nevertheless, this was the only time for our excursion. So the guy took his umbrella and holding it over us, he hurried us from the building into the car and in the rush and trying to avoid the rain and you know, my hair getting wet. You know, these the, the women here, you know, understand these things. And, and also I had my book bag and I had my, my teaching Bible in my bag and I had my own umbrella, which was still dry. And I had a water bottle, which I put in the book bag with my Bible and my personal umbrella. At first, the guide and the driver took us to several places around the city of Harbin. This is the place where in the winter they have these great ice sculptures. Have you seen pictures of that? I would really like to go there, except I wonder if it's, if it's equally as cold there in the winter as it is. Anyway, I haven't done that. Um, um, but the driver was very eager for us to see where uh, Genghis Khan, the Mongol conqueror of most of Asia and Eastern Europe to the Dnepe River, I think, had stood after he had united the steppe tribes and was beginning his expansion of power. I didn't know much about Genghis Khan, but we all know this name, right? So it was kind of a major name in uh, church history or in history, I'm sorry, I'm so used to talking about church history. Ah, ah, and now I have this daughter, I mean, what am I to do? Um, it was a bit outside the city and we drove into this rural area and there was what looked like a small hill or a mound. I mean, it was nothing spectacular. There weren't any markings, but this was the spot, I, we were told, where Genghis Khan had stood and my husband was as usual, eager to hurry up the hill, he threw open the car door, he ran out, he didn't care if he got wet. I was just a tad bit more hesitant about walking up a muddy hill in the pouring rain, but having come all that way, I didn't want to miss the opportunity either. I can stand here and tell you I stood where Genghis Khan stood. <laughs> So I reached into my book bag and, and for my umbrella, and that's where I put, you may remember, my Bible and my water bottle. And immediately I realized that my water bottle had leaked. It had come open. It spilled out over the pages of my teaching Bible. And I must have moaned, and I pulled out my Bible, and I began to dry it with some tissue I had in my purse. And I was just sick, and the, the driver, a Christian, saw my distress and realized what had happened, and he insisted that I give him the Bible. You know these teaching Bibles, they're like tomes. So I handed it to him, um, and he wanted me to go and stand where Genghis Khan had stood. So I got out of the car, I put up my umbrella, I trekked up the muddy, uh, the muddy hill where my husband, soaking wet, was standing in pure delight. Um, 
and I was a bit heartsick. I stood there, and it was memorable. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you about it today, but yet as I stood there, I was feeling that all my personal notes were soaked after all of those years of study and work, and it appeared that it could never be recovered. And nevertheless, John and I stood there with a the guide, and we looked through the rain, and I really tried to get myself in the moment of the end of the 1100s or the beginning of the 1200s. This is really a ways back to try to ratchet yourself. Anyway, I tried to get myself in that moment to think what Genghis Khan must have seen and what, he, what it must have been like for him. And when we returned to the car, and here's the point that I that I want to make from this story. When we returned to the car, the doors were all shut, of course. It was pouring rain. And the windows were up, of course, because it was pouring rain. And when we opened the door and we stepped inside the car, we realized that the car heater was on full blast. And the fan for the car heater was on full blast. And there was this Christian driver who was cradling my study Bible. And leaf by leaf of, that, of those thin pages, he was holding it up to this, this uh, very hot blower uh, on, the, on, the, on the car furnace. And he was drying the pages of my Bible. It must have been 120 degrees in that car. I am not kidding. And, and as soon as I saw it, I said, oh, no, oh, no, you don't have to do that. It's too hot for that. You mustn't do that. And then, no, he said to me very firmly. And his look to me was one of the greatest respect and kindness. This, he said, is your Bible. It is my teacher's Bible. And he, and he bowed his head. He was dignified. He was, a, he was a, a powerful man. But nevertheless, in that moment, the true servant exhibiting humility. It was such a moment of grace, such overwhelming kindness in the midst of much personal discomfort. And my husband and I sat there in astonishment. We could hardly stand outside that car when he was doing this merciful act. And we got in and we sat in the car and you know, I didn't notice the heat so much. We were in the moment of that driver's humility. And clearly, clearly, the Holy Spirit was there. I still use this Bible at home. It's dear to me. Occasionally I take it with me once in a while to teach. But it's, now it's more than a teaching Bible to me. It's an example of Christian kindness and servanthood, the love that Christians bear worldwide, and an example of extraordinary humility. I never use it without thinking of him and blessing God for him. In Philippians 2, Paul writes about our Lord Jesus and the humility <clears throat> that he demonstrated by becoming human. In order for him to become incarnate and to face death on a cross, he had to relinquish much. He had to empty himself. Those of you who study theology know that this is called the kenosis passage. This canonic emphasis is an emphasis of Jesus all through his life. Many times Jesus set aside his divinity in order to demonstrate to all of us what it is like to live a life of worthiness in humility. In humility, Jennifer, I have to ask for a glass of water. <laughs> In your chapel through Lent, you've been looking at the virtues and the disciplines that Christians seek to cultivate in life. Today in the rotation, it's been given to me to speak to you about the virtue of humility. Most Christians, indeed those in the Western world, groan to think about humility. 
It sounds so spineless. It sounds so dull, so self-deprecating, so uninspiring. We are more about emphasizing the need to take charge and seizing the day and being the leader. And for some of us, for some of us, unfortunately, thank you, for some of us, the need to dominate. Humility is not desirable in our culture. It won't get you anywhere, our culture declares. I'm sorry, I'm getting over a cold and I have this cold medicine and it dries out my throat. <clears throat> it won't get you anywhere, our culture declares. But what we Americans tend to think of when we think of humility is not the real meaning of humility, nor is it what the Bible teaches. Humility is not about a wormy existence. It is not akin to shame. Nothing could be further from the truth. Humility is about understanding and living your life in proper relationship to the world around you, in relationship to God, in relationship to yourself, and in relationship to others. Understanding who and whose you are and living faithfully in the context of, the, of that understanding. Humility is a way of being in the world and it is always about relationship. As all, as all Christians are to seek to cultivate the virtue of humility, we are not wanting to confuse humility with inner brokenness that results in our being less than God intends for us to be. Rather, humility is a virtue of maturity. It is a virtue of the heart. The bigger the heart, the greater the humility. Humility is antithetical to pride. Cautionary word is that while we consider humility, we must also consider that humanity is created in love by God to reign over creation as the crown of God's creation. So humility is not about denigration. It's about being in proper relationship with God, ourselves, and with others. In fact, there's an old rabbinical saying, I, I'm not quite sure if it's actually true, so the Old Testament people here will have to check it. But I've been told that, it, that, it, uh, that the rabbis came up with it in order to help those who felt that they were less than they should be. And the rabbis used to say that whenever a man, and hopefully they said whenever a woman, walks down the street, they are preceded by an invisible choir of angels crying, make way, make way, make way for the image of God. So the one who understands and embraces humility knows that it is not a matter of something being taken away from one's life. That is not what makes one humble. The poor are not necessarily humble in heart, although they may possess nothing. Rather, humility is a matter of giving away or sharing one's life. Whoever seeks to gain his or her life will lose it, and whoever loses his or her life will gain it, says Jesus. Jesus spoke to the matter, to the importance of humility versus pride, when he told the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You remember it from Luke 18. Seems that two men went up to the temple to pray, and one was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other men. And then he named a series of sins that other men do. And then he said, and I thank thee, Lord, that I'm even not even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I get. But Jesus continued, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. And he beat his breast and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus concludes by saying, I tell you, this man, this tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the Pharisee. 
for everyone who exalts himself or herself will be humbled, but anyone who humbles himself or herself will be exalted. We can understand the virtue of humility more helpfully, I think, if we think of it in relationship to the three theological virtues of faith and hope and love. One can grow in humility when one has true faith. Pride, the antagonist of humility, is the child of fear. Fearful persons must build a protective bulwark of pride around themselves in order to be safe from whatever may come. That protective bulwark is pride, and pride is a paradoxical sin. It seeks to preserve and protect, and it actually, ultimately, destroys. Augustine wrote, it was pride that changed angels into devils, and it is humility that makes humanity angels. However, the person of faith does not have to be afraid of what is to come because he or she knows that all of the future is in God's hands. The more that we grow in faith, the less anxious we become about our lives and about the future. That doesn't mean that we don't ever experience anxiety. But faith offers us a resting place in the storms of anxiety that rage around our lives, Scripture says, I know whom I've believed, and I am certain that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. This is a statement of faith. The deeper the faith, the deeper the humility. Faith is the soil in which humility grows. So one can grow in humility when one has true faith. And one can embrace humility when one has true hope. It is hope that sees into all aspects of life with the perspective of God's goodness and God's faithfulness. Despair, the specter, which is the dark loss of hope, is the companion of death, while hope is the companion of life. Hope is the harbor for the ship of humility, and humility rests and hope. So one can grow in humility when one has true faith, and one can embrace humility when one has true hope. And one can only have true, true humility when one has experienced the embrace of true love. Love is the most extraordinary power in the universe. It comes from God and is the very essence of God. And the person who experiences God's love and cherishes God, love for God and others is a person who is able to see others as God intends for them to be seen and to be with others in such a way that there is a hospitality of heart, as Henry Nouwen would write, that welcomes the other into true and authentic relationship. Most clergy like to read 1 Corinthians 13 at weddings, and the reading is sometimes accompanied by Ogden Nash's quip about humility in marriage. Nash, the humorist, has written, if you want to keep marriage brimming with love in the loving cup, when you're wrong, admit it, and when you're right, shut up. 1 Corinthians 13 reminds us that real love can bear all things. It's not arrogant or rude. It's not jealous or boastful. It never ends. And Jesus demonstrated in his death and resurrection that it is love that carries the day against hate. There's an old vacation Bible school song that says something like, love is the banner that is flown over the castle of our hearts when the king is in residence. Is that, is that about right? Humility resides in the castle of love. So when we seek to grow in humility, we seek to focus on faith and hope and love. And when we do that, humility bubbles up to the surface and we find um, that we have humility flourishing. In the spiritual life, faith and hope and love 
are the companions of humility. And these virtues reverberate with the chords of relationship. Paul writes to the Romans, For by the grace given to me I bid every one among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned you. For as in one body we have many members, all the members don't have the same function. So we, though we are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. This is a word that, from Paul that reminds us a proper understanding of ourselves impacts our relationships with others. And this is not just a matter of getting along with others. It is the important matter of the church functioning as it should in love and in grace and in humility with one another on a spiritual plane and a spiritual depth. Paul writes to the Philippian church, do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others better than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also look to the interests of others. And yet, there is a kind of counterfeit. It's a kind of personal insecurity that is not humility. It's not from God. It can be mistaken as humility, but it doesn't bear the fruit of joy. It bears the fruit of fear and uncertainty. Let me close with a story. Some years ago in Texas, I pastored an African-American church. And the church had some professional people in it who, and some who were struggling to make ends meet. And one summer, I was con, con, uh, contacted by the presbytery and offered a scholarship for one of my kids to go to camp. And so I invited Shanika. She was around nine years old. Her mother was in jail on a drug charge. Everyone in the community knew that it wasn't her mother who had sold drugs. It was her mother's brother, Shanika's uncle. But the family had gathered and agreed it would be easier for Shanika's mother to survive incarceration than her brother. So Shanika's mother went to prison for several years. The week before Shanika was to go to camp, a letter came from the presbytery that all the children would be picked up in the camp bus, picked up for camp in the parking lot by the camp bus. <coughs> they would be picked up at a nearby Presbyterian church at 1 o'clock. Shanika, having no way to get there, I offered to take her. And after church, we went to McDonald's for lunch, which made Shanika very happy. Excuse me. Then we went to the church parking lot where she was to meet the bus. Other cars pulled into the parking lot. They were filled with white families with white children. And Shanika and I sat there in the car. And she seemed to get smaller and smaller as she looked out the window of my car. And finally she looked at me with her face drawn and sad. All the smile from McDonald's was gone. Pastor Pam, she said, am I going to be the onlyest black girl at camp? Well, you could be, Shanika, I said, but I'm pretty sure you're going to be one of the prettiest. Shanika's downcast face lit up with hope and joy. Shanika did go to camp. She was the only black girl at camp that year, and she was definitely one of the prettiest girls at camp. She had a wonderful time. She came home having made friends with kids from all the other Presbyterian churches in our area. And after that, there would be Sundays when she wasn't even in my church because she was visiting her friends in these other churches. But when she returned that next Sunday, she came up to me after the service and her face was beaming. And she said to me, Pastor Pam, Pastor Pam, they liked me. They liked me at camp. Shanika was afraid, no doubt, that she would be excluded or disliked or treated unkindly. 
She knew what that was like. She was naturally humble. She had been discouraged into a false kind of humility. Not a humility that came from God. It had come from a segregated culture and from the loss of her mother. What she discovered at camp was that she was welcome, she was liked, she was included. She returned home full of joy and hope and confidence. She now had a proper way of thinking about who she was in relationship to God and to herself and to others, to the body of Christ. Praising God above all, having a proper estimation of oneself, loving one's neighbor, that is the true expression of the Christian virtue of humility. It is seen in the one who dries the, the pages of a wet Bible in a hot car. It is seen in the girl who ventures out to a new experience and comes home full of joy in the Lord. It is seen in Christians who embrace faith and hope and love. Humility has many expressions, but it has only one home. Humility is at home in the heart that is at home in God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The benediction. Now receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace, now and forevermore. Amen.